Now we're going to talk a little bit about the instruction execution model for MIPS. And this is a little bit how to think about instructions and some of the requirements for the processor. So there are two key concepts we're going to cover here. Processor execution model and the program storage model. So processor execution model. Processors promise two things to you. They promise that they will execute instruction in a way that appears to be sequential and atomic. So this sounds like a very theoretical definition, but it turns out to be really important. And it's particularly important because later on in this class, we're going to break both of those. And we need to make sure that the pro code still works. So sequential means that we execute the instructions in order. So if you write a program that says do instruction one first and instruction two second, the processor needs to do them in that order. Atomic means that we execute the instructions all at once. So we don't execute part of the first instruction and then part of the second instruction before finishing the first one. So let's take a look at some examples. We have a program that says first do R2 equals R1 plus R2, then do R3 equals R1 plus R2. Doing it in sequential means the processor is not allowed to flip it and do the second instruction for the first instruction. In this case, you'll get the wrong result. Atomic means that if the program says we do the first instruction, then the second instruction, the program has to finish doing the first instruction before it's allowed to start the second instruction. So why do we care about this? Well, if the, pro if the processor doesn't promise these things, it's pretty much impossible to figure out what the program's going to do. We don't know which order instructions will be executed or when they'll finish, so it's very hard to reason about and debug a program. The reality of it is that processors don't do either of these things because they're too slow. So processors break both of these rules, but they have to clean it up. So they spend a lot of time trying to make it look like you ran the program this way, and you're going to learn a lot about this when we get to the lecture on pipeline. So a question about this. How many possible ways could the following program be executed by the processor if it didn't promise sequential execution? Well, the answer here is six. If we don't promise sequential execution, then we can do any one of these first, and then any of the remaining two seconds. So that's three times two or six. And it should be pretty clear that if I can do these in any order I want, it's going to be impossible to figure out what the program's doing. So this is why sequential execution is really important. So the second key concept here is how programs are stored. And in MIPS are stored program computers, which means the program and data are stored in memory. So in order for this to work, we have to fetch or load instructions from memory before we can execute them. And we have to fetch or load data from memory before we can compute on it. That's not surprising. They're both stored in memory. What's key here is there's no difference between data and instruction memory. And this shouldn't surprise you. If you buy a computer, it comes with some amount of memory. It doesn't come with some instruction memory and some data memory. But this is also a problem. So a lot of virus attacks come this way. They use data to write over instructions, and then they execute the data they just wrote. And that allows them to do code execution that you're not expecting. This is called a buffer overflow. So stored program computers are great because you use one memory for everything, but they have some security implications. Now we're going to go through and we're going to talk about how some of the MIPS instructions really work. So we went through this before and we said there were three types of instructions. Data operations, such as addition and subtraction. Data transfer instructions, such as load word and store word. And finally, sequencing branch and jump instructions. And now we're going to take a look at them in detail.